Okay, J.R. Blair joins us tonight to present A Rose is a Rose by Any Other Name, or is it? <clears throat> he earned his master's at San Francisco State University before going on to teach there for 21 years and run the Sierra Nevada Field Station for 12. JR has been indispensable to our club for a very long time. He served uh, as president for two terms. He's been the chair of the Fungus Fair Committee many times. He creates the amazing mushroom displays for the fair, although Ginny Garrett assembles the woodland display. He teaches a wonderful introduction to mushrooms class and also loves birding. So please welcome J.R. Hey, thanks, Mike. Okay, so let's see. Let's um let's go ahead and share. So anyway. If I can find it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Ah, doing weird things. Let's wait till it settles down. How's that? Okay, good on this side. Uh, is it good over there on your side, Cheryl? Or can you see it? Cheryl Larson, I see your face. Good, thank you. And you can hear me okay, right? <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. So, um, so I have a few things, a few caveats before I start here. The first is that I owe a um, uh, so an apology to Bill uh, Shakespeare. That is. So I totally got his uh, quote wrong. Uh, so, so I did it a, a little differently here on the. Uh, uh, on the presentation. So uh, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, right? Uh, a chanterelle by any other name would taste as, as sweet, I guess, <laughs> as well. So apologies to, well, uh, to William Shakespeare. Um, another caveat is that, um, that I bit off a bit more than I Long. Um, a third caveat is that I will be doing some basic biology teaching. I'll be talking about uh, uh, taxonomy, uh, what um, comprises a, a, a binomial uh, species name, uh, things like that. So, so if you've already had uh, in your general biology classes from way back, uh, feel free to uh, step out, take a nap whatever you want to do and you can come back a little bit later for the more juicy stuff um, and that is how names have been changed um, and one more caveat and that is that um, I am not responsible for any of these name changes I haven't done a single one uh, so I'm not not going to accept any blame no I'm, I take that back uh, I need to actually give credit to those people who do this work. They're very, very uh, hardworking. They thought it out. And uh, I want to give credit to those, those folks that actually do that kind of thing. But that's not me. All right. So let's start off with some basic terminology. Uh, hang on just a second. Here's some if I can... Just my screen here a little bit. Okay. All right. So taxonomy. That's the science of systematics is the science of determining uh, lineages of organisms based on relatedness. So that's sort of a key uh, feature of systematics is, is uh, uh, looking at relatedness in among organisms. And this is undertaken by systematists. It turns out that uh, these days, especially systematics and taxonomy 
are often synony synonymized. And if you look at the, the Venn diagram of systematists and taxonomists, there's a lot of overlap. So uh, a lot of systematists are taxonomists and vice versa. In fact, most are, I would say. Um, a phylogeny. This is a representation of lineages of organisms, uh, usually referred to as a tree. Um, you can kind of think of it like uh, it's it's a, an analogy, but not quite. Uh, it's a pedigree. So if you think of a pedigree of uh, um, your family, for example, or a pedigree of uh, you know dogs or horses or things like that, uh, it's similar to that. So you can kind of think of it that way. And believe me, I'm going to show you lots of trees. You'll be tired of those by the end of the night, I'll tell you. Uh, clades are clusters of taxa in a phylogeny. I'll explain what a taxon is in a minute. Groups of related uh, organisms. Okay, And a taxon, plural taxa, is a named group of organisms, such as a species, a family, a kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the plural is being, oh, I already said that. And then finally, uh, species names. And we'll be talking about species names in a little bit more detail as we go along. But basically, uh, a species name is comprised of two parts. Uh, the first part of that uh, binomial being the genus, and the second part called the specific epithet. And this, the better term for this, or the best term for this, is a uh, standard name. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well as we go along. All right, so let's start off with uh, talking about, oops, come on. There, let's talk about taxonomic hierarchies. Uh, so the taxonomic hi hierarchy is domain, kingdom, phylum. I'll talk about, uh, about what, how that differs in a minute. Uh, class, order, family, genus, species. Now, if you've taken biology before, this should kind of sound familiar, right? So there's some mnemo mnemonics about how to remember, right? Uh, yeah, dumb kids play uh, chase on freeway go splat uh, is one of my favorites. Or uh, this one is actually a, a very common one, King David or Philip, depending. great soup. I would hope it was a mushroom soup that he came over for. Um, anyway, these this is a mnemonic to remember the, the list. Now, when you take when you took biology, you might have not heard that there is actually a domain as well. So, oh, let me go back to that. So you can put something in front of that, like, um, uh, like you can ask the question, did King Philip come over for great soup? So that puts the D in there. Or you can uh, just, you know, make an assumption about this king's um, no. demeanor. And no. call come, here, come here. Sit down. Sit down. Uh, Sit down. Oh, I think, I Sit think down. we've got to. Uh, Sit down. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm sitting down. I'm sitting. <laughs> Maybe you're not hearing that. <laughs> okay. I think somebody's dog was hopping up on their lap. Okay. So, so here's some examples. You look down at the bottom. This is Homo sapiens. This is you and I. We're in the domain Eukaryota, Kingdom Animalia, Phylum Chordata, Class Mammalia, Order Primates, Family Hominidae. Genus Homo, and the the uh, lastly the species Homo sapiens, and then let's look at a mushroom, right? If you look down at the bottom, this is our newly minted California state mushroom, Cantharellus. Um, uh, placements. Um, by the way, let me at this point talk about the difference between a phylum and a division. Um, Zoologists don't get along with everybody else. They call theirs phyla, uh, phyla being plural of phylum. Whereas um, botanists and mycologists call their groups divisions. So there you go. And one of these days, maybe they'll actually get it together and, and uh, agree on that. But in any case, um, uh, you can find this information out very, very easily on Wikipedia. So here is, for example, 
Californica, uh, Cantharellus californicus. And there's the, the species name up at the top, a little nice picture. And then there's the classification list right below it, including all of those, um, those hierarchical cate um, categories that I mentioned already. Okay. All right. Oh, let's talk about where botanists or taxonomists draw the line. Let me back up just a little bit. So, for example, you know, um, uh, what comprises primates? You know, so what are the what are the the um, definition of that? And is there anything that's a primate that really might could be listed elsewhere, right? In a different um, in a different uh, order, for example. So, you know, here's another example using uh, some uh, mammals again. So uh, the monotremes, that's, those are the egg-laying members of the um, class uh, mammalia, um, are listed as a subclass, typically, in the subclass Prototheria. Uh, and monotreme, monotrema is actually a subclass, uh, part of that. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, it would be, um, it would work if we uh, put Prototheria as a class by itself. It would still be fine. And, you know, so, so this idea of placing uh, the li lines between these different hierarchical uh, uh, locations, different hierarchical taxa, uh, is somewhat arbitrary and arguable. So there are there are some disagreements for the most part, but um, or some disagreements. But for the most part, there is agreement as to where to put these things. All right, okay. Let's talk about systematics. So this again to re to remind you is the study of classifying organisms based on relatedness through time. Uh, so there are algorithms out there that the systematists use uh, to compare character states. That share or don't share these character states um, are related and subsequently how they should be classified and named. And again, I want to emphasize the whole concept of relatedness. So these taxonomic attributes that they use to compare could include, for example, morphological um, information, physiological information, behavioral, ecological, geographical, and more recently, molecular, including genetic characters. Okay. And typically these studies, um, such studies are result in phylogenies. Uh, again, we can call them trees. Uh, another term that's frequently used is uh, our cladograms. So here, for example, is a phylogeny. Um, this is actually the same tree. It's, it's a little bit different in the way that it's constructed, but they're, they're, uh, uh, they're exactly the same. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have, um, sorry about the, the focus. I think it's the, the machine there. And I tried to focus it a little bit already. Try again, uh, Brennan. Um, so, uh, so you can see here that uh, that, for example, lizards and birds are more closely related to each other than either are to mammals. And um, also the, the little um, uh, lines there, uh, those represent character states, right? So for example, we find vertebrae that evolve uh, between the first clade, that's at the bottom there, and the second clade. So between lobsters and spiders and perch and flounders uh, and everything else above that for that matter. All right, so, so let's talk about clades just for a minute because that's really important in terms of understanding relatedness. So the idea is that clusters are of, uh, clades are clusters of branches that can then be assigned a name. So I've highlighted a clade there. And again, note that both trees are exactly the same. So I've highlight, highlighted the same taxa on both clades. 
uh, these can then be assigned a name. And the name of that particular clade, which includes um, the lizards, birds, and uh, mammals, um, is the clade Amniota, uh, because they share a character state of having an amniotic egg. Not going to get into what that is right now, another time maybe, but you get the idea. And then um, a clade, by definition, is monophyletic lineage. This is really important uh, in systematics and, and in understanding um, uh, relatedness. So the technical definition of a monophyletic name is one that includes a common ancestor and all of its descendants. By the way, the common ancestor will be represented by an internode. So here is a node. There's another node. And the common ancestor is represented by that space in between. So you see that my shaded areas, there's a little overlap in a node there, but this, this one you can see much better, uh, that there is a um, common ancestor um, uh, within which that uh, amniotic egg evolved, right? And then all of its descendants are included in that clade in order uh, Okay, so here's, here's a little test. Um, this will count for 10 points toward your final grade. All right, so you've got a blue shaded area, a green shaded area, and a red shaded area, or orange or whatever that color is. And uh, so which of these shaded areas are not monophyletic? The green. Down there, right? Right at the bottom of the green shaded area. And so there's the common ancestor and all of its descendants include actually the blue area as well, right? So this is an example of what's called a paraphyletic um, uh, shaded area, if you will. So if, for example, we were to give this a name, you know, say uh, Joe, okay? We call that Joe. Joe would not be monophyletic. We could still use the name, but it would not be monophyletic. And it would, that name would not represent um, uh, properly relatedness. Okay. So uh, in order to, again, once again, in order for this to be monophyletic, it would have to include the blue area as well. I'm going to give you some uh, another really good example of uh, an actual example of non groups, okay? So um, polyphyletic, so I mentioned paraphyletic, that's where you kind of have this extra bit in there, that blue area, we'll go back to that, so that you have that extra bit, that blue area, that is um, not represented with the name, whatever we give the green area, right? That's paraphyletic. Polyphyletic is when you have some over here and some over there. So you've got them in, and that's represented here in the red area, uh, red section. Okay, so for example, if we uh, um, say something about birds and mammals, and there is actually a term, hemothermia. What do you think that means? Yeah, uh, exothermic or warm-blooded. Uh, and that, so the mammals and the birds are warm-blooded. And so if we lump them together into a, into a group called hemothermia, based on that, it would not be a related group based on our understanding of things because they pop out in two different places on this phylogeny, all right? The uh, conversely, kind of going back to what we talked about before, this blue area, that's those are the reptiles, okay? So we've got uh, lep Lepidosauria, those are the uh, lizards and snakes. We've got Testudines, those are the turtles, and we've got the... Um, Crocodilia, the alligators and crocodiles and canes and such. And all of those are, are um, 
uh, are reptiles. Now, in order to uh, make, so reptiles is actually not a monophyletic group by virtue of that name and including what we know of as reptiles, unless we include the birds. So if we include the birds, we get what's in the yellow section there. And, um, and so that is actually a monophyletic group. Okay? Actually, tetrapoda would include the mammals as well. Okay. All right, so here is a, a phylogeny of all life. Now this is a simplified version and nobody, uh, I, I can't say nobody, but there are probably some people out there who would disagree with this rendition, but it's one that I found online and it does a pretty good job of representing um, a phylogeny that is comprised of various monophyletic and non-monophyletic groups for that matter. Actually, I can see one right off the bat that's not monophyletic. So, um, but for the most part, you can see that fungi and uh, in plants, uh, depending upon how you define plants, but in this case, uh, plants would be bryophyta, pteridophyta, uh, most textbooks don't include these two, chlorophyta and rhodophyta, in uh, this same clade or the same uh, grouping, green plants. But um, it would work, right? Because that would still be monophyletic based on this information, right? Okay. Um, by the way, the protozoa, which includes these um, uh, uh, slime mold, monophyletic group because the common ancestor is down here and it would need to include everything up here in order to be monophyletic. Okay. All right, memorize this one, please. Yeah. Okay. This is, a, this is a little different representation of a phylogeny, but it still is represented. It's what we call a, an unrooted tree, um, but it still works. And this, this is the kingdom fungi uh, and what we as a mycological society are most interested in are two segments of this group. And that's the basidiomycetes here with the, this blue curved line. Those are, are most mushrooms and other fruiting bodies that we see out in the woods are in this group, basidiomycota. And uh, some of the things that we like to collect, such as morels and, um, and uh, some um, cup fungi and things like that are in ascomycota. And the ascomycota is represented by this big red line that goes all the way around the bottom of this whole tree. There's a lot of groups of ascomycetes uh, compared to the basidiomycetes. And then these other things are things like um, bread molds and um, and chytrids, which are, are the fungi, the skins and... Um, Nevertheless, this is a, um, a tree of the kingdom fungi. fungi. All right. Okay, so let's, let's talk about um, the ta some of the taxonomic characters that are used to identify and characterize um, um, mushrooms. All right, so first of all, let's talk about morphological characters. So that term morphological refers to uh, forms, and they can be both macro uh, morphological, so things you can see, uh, colors and, and uh, uh, the um, textures and things like that, uh, or they can be micro morphological, so things like uh, spores and cystidia and things like that. So, um, so un up until recently, this has been really the main thing, right? So, uh, if you if you find an old uh, to mushrooms, uh, they're going to sort it out, uh, for example, by guild versus not guild, right? So that might be an example. It turns out, by the way, this is a bit of an aside, that, that gills actually evolved seven different times. Yeah, so uh, not just with this, uh, this is a bluet, for those of you who are not familiar with that group, 
Um, that group of gilled mushrooms, but russulas and lactarius are actually in a different lineage altogether. And then we have things like the gilled polypore, uh, split gill, uh, things like that, that also have evolved gills that are in different parts of the phylogeny, different parts of the lineage. Um, and then here is an example of some uh, some uh, micromorphological characters. So these different kinds of ornamentation on spores, uh, spore color uh, coloration when stained. Uh, this is a group of spores that have been stained with um, uh, a reagent that has turned them sort of reddish color, um, and so on. Now, more recently. What do we have as a tool? Yeah, the molecular information, right? So we have genetics that we can sort of base, add to the, uh, how we figure out what's going on with these related uh, phylogenies, these groups of organisms that are related with each other. So now, by the way, um, when people think about uh, uh, genetics and use genetics as a tool, they mostly are thinking about um, sequences. And, and by the way, this is a sequence down here of, of uh, uh, a couple of dozen uh, species of something. I'm not. And um, each of these, these rows represents a taxon. And then uh, uh, people use, uh, uh, get a, a, a piece of the DNA, they figure out the A's, T, C's, and G's, and what sequence they're in. That's called a sequence. Uh, and that's that's the columns. And then uh, they throw that into a computer, and it lines it up. And then we can see where they line up nicely and where they don't line up. So the like this big green area right here, with a few exceptions, is all nice and green. Another one over here. And so you so that's gene that's genetic sequencing. But there's a lot of other things that are used. So um, uh, protein structures, you know, the uh, how are the amino acids uh, lined up? Uh, what's the sequence of amino acids? That's a lot easier actually than uh, genetic and is an uh, older technology. Uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism, where they would uh, break a chunk of DNA into pieces based on a, a smaller sequence. Uh, so the, the, it's like a pair of scissors. They would read the sequence, and if it was the right sequence, it cut it, and they would make different sizes of, of fragments, and you run that through an uh, electrophoresis gel, and so on. If, you, if that's confusing to you and you want to know more, you can talk to me later about it. That's also pretty old information. Uh, um, to read sequences, DNA sequences is, are actually fairly um, reasonable cost. And uh, there, so there are a lot of people now who are a lot of institutions and individuals who have these machines that can read sequences and you can take a, a mushroom to them and you can have it sequenced. And so there are people that are... characters just like presence or absence of gills or spore or spore ornamentation or any number of other things that we can talk about um, as uh, data that's going to go into determining relatedness <laughs> okay or ancestry and there all right let's talk about species names now Carl, otherwise known as Linnaeus, right? Chuck, <laughs> Chuck Linnaeus, uh, right? Swedish um, scientist who uh, wrote, uh, among other things, a book called, a uh, multi-volume book called Systema Naturae. So it's basically a list of uh, all He started off with in the first volume with 17 and he ended up with like 10,000. 
close to 10,000, something like that, in a series of volumes over the course of his life of plants and animals that were known to, to science at the time. Now, it's, now at the time, the um, scientific name, I'm not crazy about that term, but we'll use it. So the scientific name for an organism was a little, um, a, a little uh, uh, tedious and, and bulky. Uh, so for example, anybody know what uh, the genus uh, Physalis is? It's a plant, uh, tomatillo. Okay, so tomato-like thing, right? So this was before Linnaeus. This was the scientific name of a species of Physalis, the Physalis angulata. Physalis annua ramicissima, ramus angulosus glabrus fullus dentato serratus. Imagine if you had to write that every time you did your research paper on Physalis. So, um, and Linnaeus got pretty tired of writing out these long, you know, sentence length names in Latin. And so he started doing a shortcut. Sort of a, a, a brief single word that would kind of cover it. Right, and separate it from other ones. So now it's called Physalis angulata. So this guy figured out that whole system of using binomials for names. All right. So um, once again, a species name is comprised of two parts, uh, the genus being the first, and that's always capitalized, and the specific epithet, uh, which is not capitalized. Uh, some old Literature, you'll find it's capitalized if it's a uh, um, named after a person or a, a place, like proper name, right? Uh, but these days, that uh, if even if it's a, based on a proper name, you don't use capitalization. Uh, and then a species name should always be italicized or if uh, it's handwritten, um, underlined. All right. Okay, so we're talking about Latin names, right? No, we are not talking about Latin names, at least not exclusively. So it turns out that there are a lot of, of um, binomials that are based on Latinized terms, okay? But other languages are frequently used as well. Greek is, is used pretty often. Uh, and then other languages are used as well. So uh, uh, my major professor, Brennan's major professor, Dr. Desjardins uh, in Hawaii, and he, he called it Hygrosibi, which is an existing genus, uh, Noe uh, Nokalani, which means uh, um, pink rose in the mist. I wrote plink rose in the mist Sorry, uh, on my cheat sheet here. That's not right. It's pink rose in the mist. Um, and... Uh, uh, Dr. Desjardins and uh, Don Hemis, uh, who's the second author here. Uh, what's that? Oh. <laughs> Quick, binomial. <laughs> Moose domesticus. <laughs> um, in the Rodentia, that's a different uh, lecture. Uh, okay, so uh, for those of you who are listening at home, a mouse just ran across the stage. Um, okay, so where, where was I? Oh, uh, Pink Rose in the Mist. So uh, Dr. Desjardins and Don Hemis, um, who wrote the book on uh, mushrooms of Hawaii, um, had identified, uh, I think, a dozen or something like that, new species uh, on the islands. And they went to Hawaiian elders, and they asked them to help with the specific epithets. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So uh, so anyway, so... Um, a, Many other languages are used. Um, show you another species that Dr. Desjardins and some others um, identified and named, and that is um, Spongiforus squarepantsia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And it's actually lat Latinized, believe it or not. The, uh, the double I at the end means it's named after someone, uh, a male someone, actually. Uh, so apparently, uh, we're pretty sure that SpongeBob is male and um, that he kind of looks like that. Okay, so you get the idea. There actually, by the way, uh, is an annual award company or uh, organization that gives um, kudos. I don't know if they give money, but they give kudos to uh, to interesting and unique uh, binomials that have shown up out there. And of course, this one definitely got kudos. You know what's cool about the sports? Oh, this is not Rambutana. That's a different one. Oh, that's right. They do. Of course. Uh, he did name another one, Rambutan, uh, Rambutanus or something like that. I don't remember the genus, but the prickly looking red fruit from Southeast Asia. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, a, a word about common names. So first of all, really, when anyone in this room says co it's a, the common name is, you're really talking about the English name. There are a lot of people who don't speak our language and have their own set of common names, right? So there's Spanish names and French names and so on for lots of different mushrooms. Um, so now there's two problems with that. One is that a lot of organisms have multiple common names or multiple English names even, right? Depending upon where you are. So let's see, for example, um, chicken of the woods is also known as, no, that's not my, that's hen of the woods. Hen of the woods is also known as maitake. Uh, sulfur shell, thank you. Chicken of the woods, sulfur shelf, same thing, right? Or more or less. And um, so there's a, that could be confusing, right? It's like, oh man, I got some chicken of the woods. No, you got sulfur shelf. <laughs> or pigs, well, violet yeah, violet chanterelles and pig's ears, right? So you can see there's a problem there. And then the other problem is that, especially with mushrooms, this is not so much a problem with animals, but have common names. So um, are you all familiar with the, uh, the uh, Audubon series of guides, right? So there's a whole bunch of, has a plastic cover uh, and uh, very thin paper. Do not take it out in the rain. You'll end up with a brick, a plastic covered brick. Uh, but anyway, um, there, the mushroom guide was edited by a guy named Gary Linkoff. Many of you know of Gary Linkoff, very famous amateur mycologist. And um, Alfred Knopf is the publisher. And uh, they say, well, this is great, but you need to put some common names on these. They meant English, of course. And uh, Gary said, well, most of these don't have common names. And, they, and the, the publisher said, well, either you do or we will. So you go look at that book and they all almost all, uh, you know, like 80% of the names in there are made up by Gary. <laughs> so bless his heart. Uh, um, anyway, okay. So, um, so let's talk about species concepts. So, you know, so how is it that people decide these, uh, what, what represents a species and what does not? Okay, because it's actually not clear cut all the time. So a species concept is, is um, a, an idea that describes the parameters uh, that a taxonomist will use to designate the name of, an, of, a, of a taxonomic rank like a genus or a family or lower such as a subspecies. Uh, now the joke is that there are as many species concepts as there are taxonomists out there. Everybody has kind of their own idea, but uh, I looked on um, on Wikipedia, and they they have outlined that there's about 26 different species concepts. I'm going to talk to you about three different um, types of concepts. And by the way, uh, different types of organisms can best demonstrate different concepts. So it's not 
something you can have one concept that covers the um, the whole um, planet. Right. So first of all, let's talk about morphological species concept. It's basically simple. If it looks different, it must be different, right? And so, um, so this could apply to macroscopic and microscopic uh, characters. Uh, could also apply to other things such as the habitat or the odor, so uh, or other subtle characters. So basically, if it's different, it sh they should be given different names in some way, right? Can you think of a, of a circumstance where you have a single species that has incredibly wide variation in, in morpholo morphology? Yeah, John. Dogs, yeah, right? So, you know, the thing that, that fits in a purse is related to the thing. So, uh, so there's a really good, now people have been really messing with dogs for a long time and the ancestral dog, they all look to like, but you get the idea. And you could also have it the other way around. You can have what are called cryptic species. So you, and I'll talk about how that works in a minute, but you could have two things that look identical. They smell the same, they act the same, uh, you know, but they're not the same. So what's going on? So you could have um, uh, things that don't fit the morphological species concept. Uh, by the way, I have here, these are bluets. And these are the uh, Cortinarius lookalike right there. So a second species concept is a biological species concept. And that you may remember this one from your biology class. Uh, so um, basically, it's about reproductive compatibility. Uh, if they meet, mate, do they have viable offspring? All right. So um, kind of boiling that down is, are there barriers to effective reproduction? That could, those could be prezygotic barriers, which would be, for example, um, behavioral. If you don't do the right dance, speak to the hand. Don't want to have anything to do with you. If you don't sing the right song, right? That sort of thing. Um, it could be particular uh, chemical kind of uh, recognition. That's what happens with plants. I mean, if you can imagine any given plant, it's gonna be bombarded by pollen, either from bees and butterflies or from the air all the time. Well, how does it know which pollen grain is gonna from the right species? Well, there's chemical recognition that happens there. Or it could be post-zygotic, and this is where the offspring would have some sort of a viability issues. Either they, um, um, uh, perish at some point during the process, either in, in the embryo stage or when it, when they're born, or it could be uh, sterile, right? So, for example, the you know the horse and the and the donkey uh, are definitely different species because when they have offspring, which we call mules, that would be a, a female horse and a male donkey, uh, then um, that's a sterile um, offspring. So that that is an example of that how that works. Um, and it turns out that this is actually a pretty good one for mycologists because uh, mating studies are very, very frequently done to help sort it out. Um, I have a, cup, a photograph of some Petri dishes here. This is where mating is successful. That yellow line right there represents uh, basically a melding of um, single spore isolates that have grown into primary mycelium. They come together and it's like, oh, okay, you're groovy. And they... Uh, the right side has a dark line down the middle. That's actually a space between these two single spore isolates. Uh, sometimes I've heard it called the line of antagonism, uh, and but not a good thing in a relationship. Uh, and um, that would be um, a, a two different species, if that was the case. Yes. Um, stuff. Yeah, that's right. There's actually one type of fungus that has, as I was doing research on this, what, there's one type that has 17,000 genders, 17,000 sexes. So the chances of it running into somebody that it could mate with are pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So 
So, uh, yeah, so a lot of fungi have multiple sexes uh, and more than two sexes, I should say. And so, um, so yeah. So this, this, is, this works actually pretty well still with fungi. So there was, when I was a, a graduate student, I can't remember who it was, uh, sent out Petri dishes to all of the mycologists all over the United States. They would put those Petri dishes out in the windowsill for a couple of days. They covered them up, sent it back. And he was able to, to find, um, I'm not sure how this all worked, but um, the idea was that this was pleurotus, oysters. So there were oyster spores, there's oyster spores in this room as we speak. Anyway, he was able to isolate the oyster spores and then did a mating study and found that there, I think there were nine different species uh, that we're all calling Pleurotus ostriatus. Um, so, so that's an example of how that, that might work. Okay, and then the final species uh, concept I wanna talk about is phylogenetics. So this is basically using, using uh, um, multiple characters and character states, not just morphological or behavioral or, or prezygotic or postzygotic barriers and things like that, but all these different kinds of, of, um, of uh, uh, characters. And then taking a look through time and space to, to look at um, hereditary integrity. I like that terminology. I actually stole it from Wikipedia, I think. Uh, but hereditary integrity. So essentially the lineage through space and time stays the same and it stays a lineage right and so so um we can then sort of infer from that um you know if you look out at the ends of the lineage at the terminal ends we have the the sort of the smallest unit and that is species and so we can we can look at that uh, sort of uh like a historical time machine uh and Uh, conversely, are they um, are these lineages uh, diluting uh, from hybridization? Uh, are they uh, uh, as it look like they're going to be a dead end? You know, there's all kinds of questions that can be asked about about the species concept um, and uh, and so on. And here's a lineage, by the way, of the genus Amanita, another uh, phylogeny representing the genus Amanita. Okay, so, all right, so now you, you, we've gotten through sort of the basics, you know, what comprises uh, a species and everything above that, how are those determined? So then once you've got, uh, got that, you, you think you have a new species, for example, then what do you do? Well, there's rules for that. And um, there are actually four of these international codes of nomenclature, sorry, five of them total, including this one here, which is the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants. So we have to work on that because fungi are not related to either of those two things. Uh, maybe some algae or, well, anyway, it's a mess. Um, but uh, these, um, there is a, an international botanic uh, congress that meets once every few years. Last time I think that, that this was produced, I, um, from what I can see, it's 2018. It's irregular when they meet. Um, but anyway, they meet together and, and, and adapt these rules. Um, they're basically guidelines for, among other things, publishing new names, uh, designating type collections, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, how to cite art authors' names, and lots of uh, other things as well. All right. Okay, so so basically, there are guidelines to putting names on things. I want to talk about a couple of sort of exceptions to uh, these things that you'll see. So um, sometimes you'll run into uh, provisional names um, or combinations. Uh, so provisional names are essentially... Uh, that's being worked on. Uh, so for example, uh, if you have um, uh, the Mushrooms of the Redwood Coast guide and you look through there and you look under zero uh, group, which is a uh, now a bully or was used to be a bully, 
is now Zero Comelis. Uh, what we've been calling Zero Comelis Zelleri, or before that, Bolita Zelleri for eons, it turns out to be a different species that we have here in, in California called uh, that they um, proposed to call Zero Comelis atropurpureus. published since uh, that book was published. Uh, you'll still see it in the book, of course, that didn't change when you weren't looking. Um, but if you look at the the, um, the uh, name changes that is coming up soon, Noah told me he's working on it. Uh, when they do the name changes, it won't be a non-prov anymore. It'll be actual name with um, uh, Frank Siegel and Schwartz as the authors. Um, another category, are complexes. So there are a lot of um, groups of species that are called complexes out there that have just haven't really been sorted yet. So there's probably somebody out there who's working on it, uh, hopefully, as we speak, or they just might be such a major complex that, that nobody's working on it because it's too intimidating. Uh, that's possible as well. Many of you know uh, the little white inosity called inosity geophila. Uh, uh, there's a lilac, um, geo, uh, it's called inosity lilacina, thought to be two different species. It turns out they, the same mycelium will produce white ones and lilac ones, and then sometimes they're always only one. Anyway, it's kind of, a, 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 that's an example of a complex. Uh, sometimes the uh, authors will use the the um, word um, or the abbreviation AFF, which means affinity, affinity, specific epithet like this one, Boletus af appendiculatus. This is in California mushrooms, which is um, written by uh, Dr. Desjardins and uh, Mike Wood and Mike and Fred Stevens from our club. Um, and uh, anyway. That is an example in California mushrooms. Uh, and that also has been changed. That uh, So David Aurora, thanks a lot, David, has changed that to a Bateria, a Bateria bolitis persolidus. There you go. So that, that's been changed um, and is now an actual name. So that's been changed. By the way, California mushrooms now has a name change uh, list that uh, Mike just put out, um, I think, um, a few weeks ago. So you can go check that out. Uh, and that's what it looks like if you're interested. All right, so now um, I want to talk real briefly about uh, type collections and voucher species. So species names, and in, in uh, many cases, higher ranked taxa, must be permanently associated with a collection. Right. So that, and if you think about that, it makes a lot of sense. So if you have if you find a new species that uh, that, you know, you're really sure it's new, it's never been seen before. You've done the research to make sure of that. And then you're going to put a name on it, a nonprofit to begin. With. That first collection that you made is sort of the baseline for the for the morphological characters and the tip, the microscopic and macromorphological characters and the genetics and so on of that uh, that are associated with that name, so that's called a type collection. And uh, at San Francisco State, we have a whole cabinet full of type collections. And so somebody who runs into that later, uh, or conversely finds something that was named hundred years ago that they think is the same thing, then they, then they can use that type collection as a point of reference and uh, in order to compare the two um, collections. Uh, okay. So um, in fact, it turns out that, that uh, those of you who are thinking about writing, uh, you know, uh, new species and putting names on things out there, uh, uh, or, or if you're just doing um, like a survey, uh, you're doing a, 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 um, a list of species of mushrooms that are found in um, Golden Gate Park, uh, and you want to publish that in a reputable um, journal, you'll need to keep voucher collections because, you know, who knows, someday 
Somebody might find something that you collected that's different than everything else and and then is um, deemed to be collection for that. So uh, now the voucher collections you want to put in a, uh, a, a um, licensed herbarium like San Francisco State or UC Berkeley or Stanford or someplace like that. Okay, so here I finally got to it, what my whole talk's about, right? <laughs> Why are names changed? All right, so there are a couple of uh, terms, a couple of ways that I'm going to discuss that, a couple of reasons for that. One is called the rule of priority of publication. So that boils down to my first sentence there, that the first published name gets priority. Uh, so it doesn't matter how old it is, uh, how, how recently or how long ago it was named, if it's the same thing, uh, then it gets, gets, then that name gets priority. And so that happens kind of frequently where, um, you know, because uh, somebody found something, uh, they didn't do the proper research, they think it's new, but it really isn't. And, um, and then they publish it as a new species. Uh, so that if somebody later finds that finds that out, then they can fix that, uh, and that would be a name change. Um, and this again is going back to the really importance of vouchering collections. So, for example, uh, here's a Hebelomus and Apizans. Mushrooms with brown spores. Uh, they're mycorrhizal. Uh, not much else in the way of characters. Uh, Alexander Smith and L.R. Hessler are two uh, were two taxonomists that were in the middle of the 1900s uh, that were active in the, those years, 1950s, 1960s, uh, who uh, were very much in, uh, very prolific in their writings. They really did a lot, and you're going to see uh, Smith and Hessler or just Smith, or just Hessler, and a bunch of some other people as author names on a lot of species out there. Well, um, between the, somebody did a, a study, the uh, Eberhardt et al. back in uh, last year, uh, looked at the name, all the names that Hessler and Smith and their co-authors wrote, uh, and they came up with 128 valid species, valid being that they were named appropriately. They, um, they went through the steps, all they follow the rules, but they didn't do the research. And it turns out that only 14 of those are currently recognized as species. All the rest are synonyms. And this is the same two guys right, that, that did this. So it's kind of easy to, for that to happen. Um, and also uh, keep in mind that, you know, they didn't have access to genetic and molecular information as well. Um, so, uh, so this was another situation where there was, um, uh, first of all, there was uh, 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 priority in terms of the the um, uh, in terms of the type specimen, and this has to do with the genus Psilocybe. So the type collection of Psilocybe is an inactive psilocybe species called psilocybe coprophila. Coprophila means dung lover. And um, psilocybe coprophila, uh, or sorry, uh, going back, uh, somebody did some research uh, about 10 years ago or so that determined that the active species and the inactive species of the genus psilocybe were, um, made them polyphyletic. They actually turned out in two different parts of the uh, lineage they're not in the same clade not in the same lineage so by the rules of priority uh because the the type specimen is an inactive one all of the inactive dung lovers that grow on on cow poop and, and bear poop should be psilocybe and the ones that are active should get a new name and and the the International Botanical Congress went like this. Boy, that's going to be a problem because, of course, everybody knows the genus. This is where they conserved the name psilocybe 
broke the rule basically and allowed that to happen. So, so the, uh, um, okay. And then finally, um, I want to talk real uh, talk about um, misidentification. Actually, it's not final. There's a little bit more. Uh, so um, you know when uh, when the uh, uh, Europeans first invaded North America, uh, they're still here. Uh, and they when they came to North America, they looked at these different things that are over here, and they say, "Oh, there's a robin." Well, what's the robin in Europe is nothing like the robin in North America. They're different categories, different lineages. Uh, oh, and there's a there's a fir tree, uh, said Mr. Douglas. <laughs> it's not really a fir, right? And cedars are even worse. Oh, my gosh. The true cedars are don't look anything like what we call cedars here, right? So there's a lot of examples of that. And that same thing has happened in, in um, the mycology so when the mycologists came over to north america they pointed out to uh this thing here uh sorry this thing here and they said oh look there's cantharellus sabarius when actuality the cantharellus sabarius is a european species it is not found in north america and so therefore pathological and uh, molecular data and they were able to figure out what we really do have here, including Californicus, Can uh, Cantharellus californicus, and a bunch of other ones as well. So that's, that's again, I just want to emphasize the importance of having voucher species, because if that had not been done, um, there might be even more uh, confusion out there. Okay. Uh, and then um, I want to talk about uh, um, splitting and lumping. Uh, so a lot of name changes are due to these two phenomena, uh, or it's actually one phenomena, two sides of the same coin, if you will. So splitting is when you take a, um, a group of organisms, say species, and you note that there are there's some variation, and maybe that variation uh, is characterized by subspecies. You say, well, I think that these subspecies should be lifted to the uh, to the species level. So you go from one species to multiple species. Um, lumping is when you go the other way, where you have um, a whole bunch of species, and there's some uh, there is some variation, but you don't think it's very much variation, and you kind of lump them together into a single species. Uh, although splitting tends to happen much more th than lumping. And that has to do with a phenomenon that we see with people wanting always to have groups of smaller things rather than larger things. So let me give you a couple of examples of that. So uh, when I took um, mycology, uh, I started in the early 80s um, studying fungi. Uh, and well into my uh, into the 90s when I uh, was getting my master's degree, um, there was this big family called Trichalomataceae, uh, which is a bunch of white spored, uh, otherwise not really distinct, uh, or quite variable, but otherwise not distinct from other white spored species. Uh, and that was the family Trichalomataceae. And if you look in Mushrooms Demystified by David Aurora, you will find the family Trichalomataceae and all that it includes, uh, a huge group. And uh, now more recently, that's been split into um, about 10 families. And you can see a list of those right there. So now it's hidden Angiaceae, Lyophilaceae, Merasmiaceae, et cetera, et cetera. So that's an example of where a group of, um, uh, of um, probably, actually, I, I'm not sure. They're running out. But in, in any case, that's a splitting event. Right? Uh, another example is, oh, and by the way, here's some, here's some, some uh, representation. So there's Matsutake, there's honey mushroom, and there's the uh, Merasmius plicatulus. Um, 
all of which used to be in Trichylomatacee. And um, now only one of those is in Trichylomatacee, and that's this one, the honey mushroom and Merasmius, of course, is Merasmiaceae. I forgot which one our malaria is in, but it's in a different family altogether. Uh, here is another example of Cortinarius being uh, split. Now, I do know that Cortinarius, or at least as far as I understand, is Cortinarius as a genus is monophyletic, but it is a big genus. There's, uh, especially now that they've included Rosites, Rosites caporatum is now in um, inside the Cortinarius group, it is now Cortinarius. Um, but that's been split uh, in various ways over the years. So when I first started learning Cortinarius, um, it was all Cortinarius. And then when I came to get, that was in the 80s. In the 90s, I came back to school and there were a, a, several taxa, uh, including Telemonia, Leprosibi, Mexasium, Flamasium, and a bunch of others that were different genera for Cortinarius. Um, but since it's it as Cortinarius, lumping, lumping is good sometimes. Um, so, and by the way, um, here's Cortinarius violaceus. If you've never seen that species, it does occur here on the West Coast. I saw, saw it at Santa Cruz Fungus Fair on the weekend. Really gorgeous mushroom. Um, that Cortinarius violaceus is the type species for the genus Cortinarius. No, it's actually velvety cap. And uh, it just looks like, uh, looks like it was uh, tailored. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. I am done. I would like to give my uh, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Valinga, Elza, uh, Mike Wood, Noah Siegel, Brian Perry uh, for their very valuable suggestions and input. There's some uh, some uh, uh, citations there if you're interested. And uh, thank you very much. Let me know if you have questions. Steph. Yeah, OK. It was pretty much there. So for those of you who are home, uh, Stephanie asked about this. The, uh, the split of fungi from uh, plants. The, so Stephanie said she took botany in, uh, in the 70s. Uh, and so I think it was probably in the 30s or 20s or 30s when it was first recognized that fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. But you know how people are in change, right? It, you know, there people by uh, by nature are pretty conservative, and uh, the text botany textbooks to this day include a chapter in fungi. It's not right. Should be at least in the zoology books, or even have one themselves, right? A book themselves. So, uh, so yeah, because so this goes back to Aristotle because uh, the. Uh, you know, they grow out of the ground. They seem to have kind of root-like things. And that's about where it stops. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions out there? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question is about the, uh, the um, initiation of uh, domains. Uh, so that's fairly recent, um, more recent than the splitting of fungi from, uh, from the uh, uh, plant kingdom, uh, but still fairly well recognized in the, uh, oh, there we go. I hope I still have everybody. I lost my presentation, but that's right. Uh, um, oh, that's okay. I don't need it. Um, so... Uh, uh, so the question is about the splitting of uh, or, or creation of domains. And if you think about it, uh, even in basic biology for a long, long time, they've talked about eukaryotes, which means true nucleus. So these are organisms that have a membrane around their nucleus 
that includes plants, animals, fungi, and a bunch of other things, uh, protista. Um, and then um, uh, the, the prokaryotes, which at, back at, at, uh, in the, up until about the 60s, I think, were in the kingdom Monera. So the kingdom Monera was separated from the other kingdoms by being prokaryotic without, with their nuclei, I mean, their genetic material not in a membrane, essentially. And so, um, uh, and then since then, proca uh, the prokaryotes have been split into two categories, the bacteria and the archaea. So this is all in the last century, but still, um, it's taking a long time for things like that to catch up to people. So that's, that's why in my presentation, I just started with King David comes over for great soup. And, but uh, did King... Yes. Uh oh. <laughs> uh, Wow, great question. So uh, for those of you at home, um, the question was, um, uh, are, we, are we in an era of uh, a lot of name changes? The answer to that is yes, definitely. Uh, and do I anticipate there being a lot more down the line? Um, I think so. I think we're probably going to have um, some more sort of fine tu fine tuning happening for another decade or two. Uh, and then I, my my expectation is it'll sort of sort out and and settle down a bit. But uh, the you know it all has to you can kind of boil it down to the um, rapidity of technological advancement in terms of understanding. Um, the relationship between DNA sequencing sequences and um, relatedness, right? So, um, not called for, like quaternarius, for example. You know, I, um, uh, it may somebody may write a paper tomorrow that that separates quaternarius out into many groups again. Um, now, whether that's accepted or not, who knows? But if if um, uh, if it's been sh if it's shown over and over that Cortinarius is a nice monophyletic group, then maybe that'll settle down. Just you know, keep it as is. But people can still, you know, um, they can still call it whatever they want. Basically, yeah. I I. I um, Put out a question to one of my um, mentors, Elsa Valinga, uh, and she I said something like, uh, 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 "So the uh, um, names are uh, accepted by this uh, Congress of International uh, uh, Botanists, right? The International Botany. Uh, that's not true. They're not. They don't accept names. They don't say, oh, yeah, that's a good name, and that's not a good name.'" Uh, unlike those of you who are birders, there's there's the uh, the English names between the British Ornithological Union and the American Ornithological Union. They accept or un or, or disavow names, uh, uh, English names. Um, but basically, they set the rules for the names. But uh, uh, by Linnaeus was Agaricus Muscarius. Agaricus muscarius. You can call it that, she pointed out. Feel free. Uh, most people won't know what you're talking about, but but you could still call it that. So yeah. So anyway, so so, um, so I'm getting on a sidetrack here, but but I think the the point is that yes, we're in a in a, a really big um, point of increasing our understanding of relatedness and um, it's getting a little bit out of hand in some places, but for the most part, it's, it's right on and people are sorting things out appropriately. 
Um, and that's going to continue for a while. Kurt. Just curious, what came first, the birds? What came first, the birds or the mushrooms? <laughs> uh, I think it was the egg. <laughs> oh, my interest. <laughs> I thought you were talking about. I thought you were talking about uh, tens of thousands, millions of years ago. Uh, um, <laughs> In the spring of 1982, I, t I took us at, at in the spring of 1982, I took a 16 unit course at the Evergreen State College in ornithology. 16 unit course in the mushrooms of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so yes, birds edged it out by a by a summer. <laughs> yeah, there's a, if you want to take immersion classes, go to school at Evergreen. Uh, yes. Okay, so the question is about the process for identifying mushrooms. Right? Am I boiling that down? Oh, yeah, like using uh, Google Images or Seek or something like that. It's risky as heck. <laughs> so it's really, really tricky to use uh, AI um, applications right now to, um, to identify mushrooms. It's gonna get better. AI is going to get better, folks, whether you like it or not. Uh, but, uh, you know, the more sort of data in uh, makes the output better. So that's going to get better. But right now it's, uh, you know, what they, what's the other term they say? Garbage in, garbage out. So if you take a photograph of the top of a mushroom, um, that's not that's not enough. If you take a photo of the top of the mushroom and the bottom of the mushroom, that's better by more than two times better, I would say. But in some cases, you need a microscope on top of that. So, so that, you know, so it kind of depends upon uh, the identifiability of that particular mushroom. So if you were to take, take a, a photograph of a shaggy mane, just the top, the AI or me or you know anybody else who is looking at that photograph would go, oh, that's just shaggy me because there's nothing else that looks like that. But if you were to take the a photograph of the top of a of a, um, uh, uh, a, a, a false chanterelle um, without taking the picture of the bottom, you, you might be misidentifying something or AI might be misidentifying something. So, so I'd say it's a little tricky right now. I, uh, I strongly suggest that you join the club and go on the forays and learn from people. Uh, and you'll, you know, over time, uh, you'll start to be your own AI. Uh, well, uh, that, sorry, that unofficial, uh, unartificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> unofficial identifier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Than just like the, like, uh, yeah, so uh, what's, what, uh, for those of you home, what Stephanie was suggesting was also using uh, a guide, a field guide with key. And right now the best one out there is California mushrooms. Um, the mushrooms of the, of the Redwood Coast is an excellent um, um, resource, but it doesn't have keys to, uh, to genera and species. So, um, uh, I'd suggest having both of them. They really both have their strengths, but the key is in the California mushrooms. And so, uh, but it, it would take some work to learn how to use that. So again, um, uh, going with people and especially if they know how to use keys, asking them how that happens.